Welcome to Front and Center, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. We're about to begin our fourth month of broadcasting, and we're producing two summary videos to explain how these conversations weave a foundation for writing our new story together. Steve, what would you like to add? Well, thanks, Mike. At a time when Americans are more politically polarized than any time since the Civil War, we created this podcast to activate what could be called the new spirit of collaboration. 65 or 70 percent of citizens from all sides would rather work together than fight one another. Our playful way to say it is we're here to bring left and right, front and center, to face the music and dance together, to turn the funk into function and leave the junk at the junction. <laughs> yes, we're working to help bring that new majority together so we can write a new story. And to do that, we needed a guiding beacon to shine the light ahead of us, to help us see where we are going. Charles Eisenstein provides that beacon from his book titled, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. That's why we began building our foundation with Charles Eisenstein as our first guest. What I call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible is, is a being. I understand it as a being, this future that reaches into the present with these tendrils that, that awaken recognition of what's possible. The tendrils being things like experiences of forgiveness or generosity, you know, kindness, um, healing. And, and you have that experience and there's a, a recognition, a feeling of recognition, a feeling of a promise of home and therefore hope, authentic hope, which is a premonition of a possibility. Those are precious treasures. Our ascension into a new story is a collective effort and a collective experience. So part of the uh, surroundings or the circumstances that we are in, we meaning most human beings on this planet, at least to the extent that they have received a modern education, that they use money, participate in a market economy, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pretty broad we. We are immersed in what I call the story of separation that tells us, it's a mythology, basically. It tells us who we are, what's real, how to be a man, how to be a woman, what's important, how to live life, what the purpose of a human being is. Uh, it tells us the nature of change, how change happens. It, it narrates our political reality, our social reality, and even maybe our material reality. And my, my basic premise of all of my work is that this story that has carried civilization for hundreds, if not thousands of years and intensified in our time is breaking down, leaving us with a crisis of meaning, a crisis of identity, a uncertainty, a panic even, but also a sense of a possibility, a possibility of transcending the age-old circumstances that we've called human, the human condition. And that's why I call it the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, because that feeling often goes against what the rational mind, which is steeped in the old story, believes to be possible. But the heart knows that yeah, the world is supposed to be and can be so much more beautiful, authentic, joyful, harmonious, and alive than what we're accustomed to. So that's, that's the basic premise of it. Um, so there we have the contrast that defines our, our new word, situation. We have this more beautiful world that reflects the greatest aspirations of humankind. And there's a blocking force being the story that dominates our culture the story of separation. We can see how the culture of separation has us using our differences against one another, but what if there are a way to turn these dueling dualities into dynamic 
duo dance partners so that we use our differences to face our challenges together. That brings us to our second guest, Charles Randall Paul, whose process of religious diplomacy brings opposing viewpoints into conversations as, quote, trustworthy rivals, like the team of rivals that comprised Abraham Lincoln's cabinet, where he had individuals who held very strong opposing views and yet worked collaboratively to preserve the union. That's what diplomacy is. It, it owns the fact that we want to create change in all our relationships. Can we still have a conversation? Can we still desire to make each other part of each other's lives as a trustworthy rival, someone who is both critical and appreciative, sustain peaceful tension between rivals who will remain rivals because in their integrity, they can do no other. We like to call it a collaborative contestation where they engage their differences and try honestly to persuade each other to see things differently. Right. We like to say, the, the, the goal of diplomacy is not tranquil peace, it's peaceful tension. It will actually enhance your truth by giving you deeper perspectives, seeking the whole truth together. The fact- seeking the whole truth together, that's a helpful first step in writing our new story together. Charles Randall Paul also explains why his own religious tradition invites all voices to create what he would term an achievable heaven on earth. The Latter-day Saint idea using biblical texts was that God um, actually wants this world here and now before heaven to be a Zion where people can thrive together who have differences, right? And Joseph Smith, who was the original uh, Latter-day Saint prophet, Made, he said that the, that the idea of Zion should be our central goal in all we do. And so, in answering your question, uh, my Latter day Saint point of view of, of an ideal world is one where the best of all ideologies, and I'll, and I'll put out there the best of doubters, <laughs> the best of the atheists, the best of everybody, whatever the, the goods are that come out of your worldview, the best of that would be brought into Zion mm. and would be digested, not vomited, but somehow digested yeah. usefully by all the tribes, not, not homogenized into a single reality but everyone would feed off of everyone else's highest and best stuff. Two words come to mind to describe what it takes for a community where a diverse population can thrive together, reunion and kinship. Our third guest, longtime activist Bobby Austin, whose work involves public kinship, tells us we can have unity without uniformity. Ethnic groups have their own ways of doing things and their own cultures. But a huge society like our society, which is multifaceted, multiracial, and multicultural, has to have an overall common culture that we all can aspire to, can assert as ours, and that is not doesn't belong to this person or that person, but that I help to build that culture. Without a common culture, we will destroy a country. I think there is in this younger American generation a more open uh, idea of who they are as they explore themselves in ways that we could never have imagined. It may be that old people like us become the the mitigators, the midwives, the difficult and unkind world dies and a new one is born because that is the struggle, the struggle of a new world and an old world and a new one uh, coming into um, into play. I, I do believe that. So when looking for that common culture, where do we turn? We need to turn back so that we can go forward. And that means we turn to indigenous wisdom and how its deep rooted past 
points us toward a healthier future. Speaking of the next generation, we invited Shauna Blue Star Newcomb to share with us the reverence code, which brings the wisdom from her Native American traditions and helps direct us to a future, a future where we are connected to the web of life, to one another, and our own unique soul. But first, she has to address the work her father, legal and Latin scholar Steve Newcomb, did on the doctrine of discovery, how the culture of separation and domination caused the nearly complete decimation of Native American peoples and created a wound that still must be healed. And speaking of that domination uh, code and this doctrine of discovery, I feel like there is really a different origin story that many people have not understood and this deeper history to this roots that go way, way back centuries old um, that, you know, it began with, um, well, I understand and appreciate, you know, I, I honor all spiritual paths. The historical context is that it began with the Vatican church and um, these papal bulls that you mentioned um, were issued by these popes in the Vatican. And my dad has been able to translate those directly from Latin to English. And they say um, to conquer, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, pagans, and enemies of Christ, to take all of their lands, possessions, and gold, and put them into perpetual slavery for God, glory, and gold. My dad has a film, The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. Um, in that one-hour film, it's been opening hearts and minds throughout the world, and I feel it's very enlightening for people to really see that and say, wow, I had no idea. I've, I've been through graduate school. I've, I've had all these degrees and I've had all this education. How could I not know this history? And it's because I feel, you know, it's history that hasn't been really told or focused upon until now. Um, and my dad has been doing that work for 40 years now. So really paving the way for many other people that are, are also speaking about these things. But I feel like this is also painting a very clear picture on that domination, dehumanization uh, patterns that are very prevalent in all aspects of our lives today. So I feel like it, you know, it's affecting our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our spirit, our sense of purpose, um, our connection with our families and relationships, our abundance and our impact in our communities and certainly on the planet. Um, but the other side of it, I feel like as well, is that we're working through what I see is very much a spiritual evolution that we're able to have the pendulum swinging from, I feel like at one time we began all people throughout the planet, there was an original spirituality that was based on reverence and a deep understanding with sacred laws that we have still to this day within our indigenous cultures and understanding of this connection with the land and really honoring it as our mother earth. And we don't harm our mother, of course. And so there's a different kind of a mentality that is really based on respect and reverence um, and a deep understanding of what it means to really see um, a way of life that's going to perpetuate life and reverence for future generations going seven generations and beyond. The more that we can connect on this deeper root that is our, our wounding for all peoples throughout the planet. It's not just one person or another person. Yes, we've all been traumatized. And really the root of that is that domination code, that dehumanization, which is really, you know, about abuse. It's about abuse of the planet and really thinking of nature as commodity. And when you look at the word civilization, it is another word for it would be domination. So that domination culture began where civilization began. So history is only told through the lens of domination. It isn't just one group of people. It's going all the way back to those Roman times, to the Greek times, that those narratives and understandings of what it meant to really have civilization and to establish this pattern was something that was being played out all over across Europe. The root of things here with that domination, dehumanization root I think that's really a, a point where we can come together because that is the source of our collective trauma. That's the opposite of the domination code is the reverence code. And 
um, you know, it's, it's this awe and this wonder for life and um, really this deep spiritual connection that there are no words to even describe. I see that it's by design in a way that all of these things are coming to the forefront, um, the shadows coming to the light in order to be witnessed and healed. And so I, as painful as it is to have all of this coming up at us right now in a way, it's like, okay, look, all the alarm bells are ringing around the planet. It's time for us to make changes, dramatic changes, um, and, and start to look at things in a new way from a different perspective. And, and how can we start to yeah. create a new story and a new visioning and really see our possibilities? Because I feel like the spiritual path that is so beautiful and so profound is that we have innate superpowers. We have intuition and incredible guidance with us on a spiritual level that was cut off from us. It's like cutting off our root. And that's the reverence code. You know, it's so important to remember we all carry the trauma of our own history with us. As Shauna suggests, to make this very necessary spiritual evolution, we have to acknowledge, address, and transform the collective trauma into forgiveness so that we can collaborate together and heal. Please check out part two of our review show, where we learn how being a lost people has contributed to our repeating patterns of trauma how the reunion of native and European tribes of all cultures who now share the soil of America will help us heal. We'll learn about the significant influence our indigenous tribes had on our founding fathers and the framers of our nation. And then finally, how a project that brings all sides together in respectful conversation is already helping to build the scaffolding for kinship, reunion, and the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Oh.